Thank you, Heavenly Father, for reminding us what you mean to us, what your goal and purpose in your relationship with us. And today, Lord, we ask you that you would fill us with the knowledge and your grace and wash us over, Lord, with that flood. Help us to see Jesus and to hear him speak to us and desire to have a relationship and a meeting with him. Lord, today I ask you to stir with our hearts a need, a desire, and willingness to make a decision. Recognizing your faithfulness to respond and to accept it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Each and every day I'm fighting with a, with a desire to say Happy Sabbath. <laughs> and uh, it's Happy Sabbath. It, it is coming, right? This is uh, fourth unto Sabbath, right? Or fifth, whatever, <laughs> what, day, what is it? You know, every day is unto th Sabbath, amen? So we, we're looking forward to it. I, I apologize for not having our daily outlines for you today. I, uh, so, something came up and I was not able to, uh, to prepare them today. So tomorrow I'll have a, I'll have a double handout for you that will contain uh, the outline for today and, uh, and, and the one for tomorrow. But before we start, I want to ask our, uh, our row host to give out our commitment cards that, that are for today. Instead of waiting until the very end, uh, I, I, I would like to start, start with it. Um, and can somebody give me one as well, please? <laughs> Thank you. Let me tell you why I'm doing this. It, I am the type of person who hates phone calls from uh, salespeople because they want me to make a decision right there and then. <gasps> Sorry, it's such a good opportunity. If you hang up, you'll never get it again. I never make a decision on the spot. I want to be aware of what I am going to decide. Okay? So today, I want to I let you know, we will be talking about baptism. Now, I know, I know that a vast majority of us here today have been baptized. And therefore, you need this card more than anybody else in this room. Because I don't want you to assume that this is message for somebody else. <laughs> there is a part in your life and mine where our commitment to God can be made deeper, can be refreshed. And there are some of us who need to honestly reevaluate our life and to say, Lord, I may need to make a strong and public recommitment to you. Amen? You know, there was one time I heard, I heard a preacher say it in his, in, in his sermon, which I really loved. I just don't know how to put it into practice, and I never saw him do it. But he said, you know, if I am preaching and you feel the need to pray, raise your hand. Because he says, praying to God is more important than me talking to you. I thought, that, that's amazing. And so, so today, uh, I'll tell you, if during this message you feel the Holy Spirit talking to you, you make a decision there without me having to ask you for it or to, to wait until the very end. Amen? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. If you hear his voice, respond to it. So, today's message is on baptism. What does baptism mean to you? You know, in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul eloquently and beautifully encompasses, says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. What does the baptism mean to us? Does it mean forgiveness? Forgiveness for, for our sins, for our past? Does it mean cleansing? Where not only are we forgiven, but we but we washed by Christ's blood, by the renewal. Does it mean acceptance into the family of God? Right? Paul says in Ephesians that 
that God has foreseen us before the foundation of the world into the adoption. So the, so the baptism makes us part of, 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 of the family of God. That's why personally I believe that a baptism cannot be uh, disassociated from the unity with, with, with the church of God because where you accept it. Baptism means assurance, right, of uh, uh, the promises of God that, that he makes for us in the future. Anything else? What does baptism mean? It's not a trick question. <laughs> but you agree with me so far at least, right? Now, my challenge with, with myself is that when, when, I, when I begin to list all of the things that, that, that baptism means to me, what I find is that majority, vast majority, fall into the burial death part, right? It's the burial that I'm separated from my sin, that I am forgiven from this. You know, it's Christ's death that forgives me from my sin, that it cleanses, it cleanses me. And I find that very few apply to that second part of being resurrected into the newness of life. And the things that do relate to the newness of life, most of the time I see as something far, far away. You know, the, the eternal life, the eternal future. So it seems that most often baptism is kind of a, uh, a cross between a, you know, a, wittering, a, a winning a, 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 like a ticket or pass you know, where you get to go. Uh, and you didn't pay for it. it it's, it's sort of a, a membership into exclusive group, you know, where now you belong, you know, uh, through it. Uh, and sometimes baptism is still as the, seen as this uh, fix-it-all pill, you know. You do it, and then your troubles get away, your, 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 your sins are gone, or problems are gone, your, you know, the past is clear, and the future is, is, is uh, assured. About a year and a half ago, I, w I went through my citizenship uh, swearing. Was it was it was called S swearing in? Yeah, you know, the citizenship ceremony where we, and and it struck me that you know I, I worked hard for a long time to become a citizen of the United States, you know, and and it seemed to me like you know the citizenship was the goal. But then, as we were being sworn in, I realized. There is more than just having it. You know, yes, I belong now, and it's, it's a blessing, and it's a privilege, but it's also a responsibility. You know, just because I'm a citizen, you know, nobody's giving me keys to a new car, <laughs> you know, and starts depositing things into my account. You know, there, there's more to it than just saying, I have it. Now, now that you have it, what are you going to do with it? You know, and, and we see that there are many aspects about our life, about our life which, which we often see as this, as this generic blessing. But when, once we get it, you know, marriage. Oh, we thought marriage would be wonderful, right? Oh, I want to get married. But once we got married, we go, wait a minute. There's more to it than just saying, ta-da, you know. Uh, driving, that's a privilege, but it's a responsibility. Ownership, you know, home ownership. Firearm ownership, whatever it is, there, there, there's a dual connection. Merely having it doesn't mean anything. There's some, something, has, you know, it's, it, it's, it is a more complex uh, matter. So today, when we talk about uh, baptism, I want to go to Mark chapter 1 and to share with you a story of Christ's baptism and, 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 and through it to show a dynamic that sometimes is probably lost behind our, 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 our general perspective. Now, let's, let's familiarize ourselves with the passage. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the spirit drove him into wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels also ministered to him. The, the title of our series is, What is Important to Jesus? Tell me, please, is baptism important to Jesus? Why do you say that? 
because he did it. Now, the amazing part is that he didn't need it. So if Jesus did something that he did not need to do, that, that makes it pretty important to, <laughs> to look at and, and to understand. You know, we know that he didn't need to be cleansed. We know he didn't need to be forgiven. We know he didn't need to be renewed. We know he didn't need to be assured the future like we do. So there's, there's something about baptism of Jesus that, that, that can help us to understand. Now, remember Paul said, we were baptized with him into his death, and then we were resurrected with him into the newness of life. Now, if we were baptized with Jesus into his death, what kind of life were we resurrected into? His high priestly ministry that he does for us right now in heaven as mediator? No, this life. Because you see, we die with Jesus symbolically while he died, literally. But as we are resurrected, we are resurrected into the real life. Now, Jesus was here also symbolically died and resurrected, right? Because the, that was the baptism. So as he was symbolically resurrected from the baptism into this life, we are literally resurrected into this life as well. And, 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 and so I want to, I want to focus on, on the dynamics of, of, of this passage. Now, I don't know if you mark your Bibles or not, but I, I strongly recommend when you read the Gospel of Mark to circle all of the words immediately. Those are key words in Mark. Mark uses them as a, as a signpost or, or if you want to, a neon post. Anytime you see this word in the Gospel of Mark, it's, it's more significant than chapter divisions to me because chapter divisions came later by people who were just dividing the stories but these words were put in by Mark to signify something something important or, or, or a flow or connection to something else so here's an interesting uh, you know and, and as we see this pericope of the story is broken into two parts first of all what happens immediately after Christ's baptism and what happens immediately, immediately <laughs> after Christ's baptism, which kind of shows the two parts. What is the first thing that happens after Jesus' baptism? The heavens open and God declares, this is my beloved son. That's the first part of the baptism that we love so much. The part where we are also assured of God's love. Amen? Where we are assured of his forgiveness, where we are assured of his acceptance, where we are assured of the future that... God gives to us. But by itself, that is not enough. Because what we find is that immediately after Christ was declared, then it says, and the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And that's a strong word, drove. Right? The Spirit didn't tell him, go there. The, the Spirit didn't command him. Driving Im implies almost a physical force. You see, the baptism of Jesus was more just a way of discovering that God loves him. The baptism of Jesus was a step of commitment and surrender. Do you remember, shortly before his literal death, we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there are these words that we like to repeat where he said father let this cup pass me but right before this moment of death i commit myself to you so that not my will but your will will be done what we find is that after the symbolic first death that Jesus experienced with baptism, when he arose, he displayed the same commitment. Father, I don't feel like going to the wilderness, but I have submitted to you. And I understand that this is a necessary part of my experience. Baptism is a commitment. Baptism is a commitment in acceptance of what God has done, of how God perceives you, but is also a commitment of what God expects of us. 
When we die, we die to sin. We die to our past. But we, when we arise, we rise into a life with Him. And that life is not something that happens far, far away in the future or not in a, in a distant future, but it happens now. I remember growing up in the, in, in the former Soviet Union, seeing my father and my grandfather baptizing people. And, uh, and I used to hear these things, and only, only now that I am a, a, you know, an adult practicing life with God, do I, do I realize the depth of the value of those words. They said, you know, during, you know and remember, you know, baptism during a communist time was, was, a, was a challenging <laughs> commitment. And that's what they would say. You know, baptism is a significant part of your life. There are many things that will be different. But don't think that the decision to be baptized has been your hardest choice. The true tests are going to come now. Because now that you are committed to God, you'll find that it will affect your relationships with your family, with your co-workers. It will affect your livelihood because now you will be living by and practicing principles and values that you didn't before. The true test of your baptism is not to say, yes, I agree, but whether you can live with what you have committed to do. The gospel is such unlike any other literature. Jesus, immediately after the declaration, is taking you to the wilderness. And <laughs> can you, I mean, can you understand how God shows his love? Would you live with your husband and wife if that's how they declared their love to you? When I told my love, my wife that I love her, and, and, and she uh, declared her love to me, I knew that there would be things that she would expect of me and, and, and things that I would expect of her. But most of the things were that we, we would love and care and respect and honor each other. Uh, but here God says, I love you. Now let me send you into a wilderness for 40 days when you're going to starve and thirst and uh, the wild animals are going to surround you and the devil is going to tempt you. Would you say yes to a relationship like that? If your lover commits to test you to struggles and trials, Marx really wants us to understand this principle in the life of Jesus. Notice in his gospel, he doesn't even tell us about the details of the temptation. That's irrelevant to Mark. What is relevant to him is to understand the connection between the choice that we make for God, the declaration that he makes about us, and then the life submission that follows that declaration. As a matter of fact, well, my first thought was to name this sermon anti-baptism. <laughs> because if you truly understand, if you truly understand what it is, you would not be so eager. Well, not that you would be so eager, but you, we would not be so careless with talking about our baptism or, 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 or encouraging others to baptism. We would want them to be commitment, committed, but we will want them to be committed on the right foundation, knowing that unless we are fully aware of what it is that God leads us towards, making the commitments unaware is a dangerous thing. When... when uh, when the readers of Mark were reading these passages, you remember or when they were hearing them, their minds were connecting the words and the stories to, to something past in their history. So when they heard that the Spirit drove Jesus into wilderness for 40 days, what do you think they were remembering? The historical experiences, right? And Paul himself connects the wandering of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years in 1 Corinthians 10 to the baptism and then the journey with God. Remember, the, the, you know, the passing through the Red Sea was the symbolic baptism, which followed immediately by the wilderness experience. Now, today, I don't want to talk as much about the wilderness experience of, 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 uh, uh, of the people of Israel, but I want to talk about three specific uh, Bible characters. First one is Moses. 
We know that Moses took more than 40 days. It took him 40 years. What was the goal of his wilderness experience? Moses' life is a, is a wonderful example. It is an example of miraculous appointment and uh, provision of God. As a matter of fact, the beginning of Moses' life is how we all see our baptism some, sometimes, right? It starts tumultuously, but then he is rescued from the water and sent back straight into the palace. That's what we want baptisms to be, from trouble into near paradise. But when we look at Moses and, and we see his consequential life, we'll probably think of the, you know, the, the palace, even that was God's decision, but it may not have been the best place for Moses. And I'm not questioning God's appointment. You understand that? But what, what do we know about Moses when he grows up? Is he reliable? Is he willing to follow? No, he's self-reliable. He's self-dependent. He's arrogant. And it's because of who he was that God has to drive him into the wilderness for him to be broken down. Moses spends 40 years before he can meet God. Not the God of his imagination, but the real God. And the God that he meets is, is different from anything that he could have expected. And there, not only does he learn who God is, but he submits to him, and what happens? He walks out with a mission. See, when you meet God, it's not just something that happens between you and him. When you meet God is when we become involved in his mission, in his role. A second man that I want to, uh, to talk to you about is named Elijah. Elijah started differently from Moses. We find that the beginning of his ministry, the pre-wilderness Elijah, was much more successful. He was a prophet. He was not a murderer. He was an effective prophet. He had heard from God. He was sent by God, and he, and he saw miracles and evidences. But Elijah still needed an experience of surrender. In 1 Kings 19, we read the story where Elijah seeks his own death. He says, God, kill me now. And God says, you will have to die, but not by suicide. There is a different death. What is a baptism? It starts with death, isn't it? It's, 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 it's kind of interesting, the parallel. There. So God says, okay, you need time. Do you know how long Elijah spent in the wilderness? 40 days. And there, as God nurtures him, as there, as God feeds him, there, as he takes time, he meets God also. And he meets God also in a way that he never expected. Remember, he expected thunder, he expected lightnings, he expected earthquake, but yet God comes in a different context. And if before Elijah was zealous for God, but zealous because of the sin of the people, now he is committed to God because he knows him. And if you take the time to see, you'll find a stark contrast in the attitude and expression of Elijah before and after the wilderness experience. He is generous. He is gracious. He is kind. He draws to himself <laughs> rather than pushing away. Finally, there is a third man. His name is Job. Now, this man lived a Christian American dream, didn't he? I say Christian American because he had the both of both dreams. Not only did he have a home and the children, you know, and well, didn't have cars but had camels. You know, he had, he had all the all, all of the uh, 
physical possessions that you know the world can dream you know we, all the evidences that god blesses you but we also know that he was a good man he was a, a faithful religious man he he loved the lord he served the lord he sacrificed and he even did so on behalf of his family and children so if Moses is not something who would identify with and Elijah, we wouldn't mind being, you know, the domain meter for it. Job is, is, is even better than Elijah. There seems to be nothing wrong with Job, right? After all, isn't that the pretense of, of our understanding? Job was perfect and God just tested him so that everybody else can see who Job was, right? Notice how Job himself looks at these circumstances. And the final outcome of the trial comes from the last chapter of Job, verse uh, chapter 42. I'll start with verse 2 just to give us his entire speech. I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What was the purpose of Job's trial? What was the purpose of his wilderness? Job meets God in a way he has not met him before. Job commits to God and he sees himself in a way that he hasn't seen himself before. And even though throughout the entire passage we find Job saying, I am righteous, I am righteous, I did nothing. What is his self-evaluation when he sees God? I abhor myself. And I repent. Which of these three characters could you identify with at the moment of your baptism? Where are you now? Have your baptism led you into the wilderness where your commitment to God was revealed and God himself was revealed to you? Or do you still need to go into the wilderness? And do we still need to meet God? Not from what we knew about him, but from the way that he shows himself. Wilderness is not a geographical place. Wilderness is an experience that helps us to know God and to surrender to Him. Wilderness allowed each person. Burning bush for Moses was unlike anything else that he was familiar with. Either in his Hebrew history or even in Egyptian mythology. Gentle blowing of the wind for Elijah was contrasted with his expectations of fire, thunder, lightning, and earthquake. The purpose of the baptism of Jesus is to show us the kind of life that we ought to commit to and the kind of life we ought to expect. It is an example of what God wants to do in our lives to lead us to surrender, to lead us to cast away our idols, idols, things that we rely on besides God, effectively substituting him, and even idols as a false idea of who God is. And those are much harder to get rid of, aren't they? Let me read to you an interesting statement. Those who are truly sanctified have a sense of their own weakness. Wait, Pastor, isn't justification where I'm exposed to my weakness? Sanctification is where I am made perfect, right? Those who are truly sanctified have a sense of their own weakness. 
feeling their need, they will go for light and grace and strength to Jesus, in whom all fullness dwells, and who alone can supply their wants. Conscious of their own imperfections, they seek to be more like Christ and to live in accordance with the principles of his holy law. This continual sense of inefficiency will lead, will lead to such entire dependence upon God that his spirit will be exemplified in them. The baptism of Jesus was a step of complete surrender so that his life could reveal the leading of the Spirit. We think we're in control of our life. We, we want to be in control of our life, life of others near to us, and sometimes even of God, because we have expectations, because we have opinions of Him. But baptism and subsequent wilderness experience is what we need in order for us to escape the world of illusion that we live in. You know, my, my wife and I, we have two children, five-year-old and two-year-old, and my five-year-old is like nothing else in my life that has been used by God to show me my illusions. We, we teach him how to pray, and he loves to pray. He tries to pray in every little language that he knows, even though he mixes the words. And, uh, you know, and, and we enjoy it, you know, I... As a matter of fact, I'll be showing some recordings in, in the weeks coming up of him teaching me and Natasha how to pray. But there was one day when we sit down to eat and he said, I don't want to pray. Where every time he's eager and he jumps in front of everybody else, I don't want to pray. And then as a father, you know, I, I thought I would treat it the same way I treat him when he doesn't want to eat or take a bath. What do we do? Threaten or bribe, right? <laughs> it's good parenting technique. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. But I stopped myself and I realized, yeah, I can make him eat and I can take him make a bath. But if I make him pray, am I really accomplishing anything? Will that turn his heart to Jesus? What will? What can make him commit to Christ except his need? Except realizing that he is in the wilderness and it is only his connection to God that can help him pass through that wilderness. Now, I could make his life so difficult that he would cry out for Jesus, but that would be unethical and immoral. So uh, instead, I, I, tried, I tried to model. We pray for others. The great thing about driving to Kalin and back every day is that we see accidents virtually every day. And, you know, I tell him, baby, let's pray for those people. They're in trouble. They need Jesus. Because, I, you know, I, I don't want him just to grow up to think, well, blessings is where God is seen to me as blessings is what, you know, I have to relate to him by or, or, or my personal needs. I, I want him to understand that, even though he walks in the shadow of the valley of death, God is with him because that is the relationship that they intentionally formed between each other. Do you want to know God, the real God? Do you want to know God's will? Do you want to be left? Do you want to be driven by God? That is why he invites you to follow him into all righteousness and to be baptized even as he was baptized. Because as we enter into that relationship with him, not only is our past and the future guaranteed, but our present becomes meaningful. You know, so often I pray for wisdom and, and, and I wish that I'll wake up, I'll be smarter. So often I pray for patience and hope that when I wake up, I'll have that patience. Life doesn't work that way. God is not a genie <laughs> and, and 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 the truth is there are times when we treat the baptism in the same way that's a you know it's 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 a it's a trick or it's a miracle experience where it is a miracle but of different sorts 
It is a miracle of God's presence at a time when we feel like He is not there, at a time when we feel that He is alone. Real life works like willingness of Moses, Elijah, Jacob, and Jesus when He was hungry and thirsty, surrounded by wild animals, and worst of all, surrounded by the devil himself. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus tells a parable about a barren fig tree. And the master said to the keeper, cut the tree down. It hasn't borne for three years. By the way, how many months is three years? Almost 40 months. <laughs> uh, that, I was just trying to make a connection. But the master says, cut the tree down. It doesn't produce. And do you remember what the keeper says? Wait. Let me prune it. Let me fertilize it. Brothers and sisters, the keeper is Jesus. You and I are the tree. And fertilizer is what we mostly see in our lives. Do you know what they used to fertilize in those days? How often do we think our life is a fertilizer? Not understanding, not seeing the master who applies that so that we can grow, so that we can produce, so that we can be revived. In baptism, we die and we are resurrected to a new life. Today, brothers and sisters, I strongly urge you, consider the life of Christ and how it is an example to you and I. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus expressed it from a different perspective. He said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and in his Father's and the holy angels. What life is Jesus talking about here? the life of the cross that he bare. Now, he's not asking us to bear his cross, but he says, as I was resurrected to this life of ministry, as you become mine, if you want to follow me, don't follow me because I forgive you and give you stuff. By the way, and that comes as a bonus package, but follow me because your desire is to do what I did, to bear the cross. Put up your cross and follow me. Now tell me, please, when you think of your baptism, did you understand the dynamic of Christ's life as it applied to you? And is that what you had committed yourself to? As you think about the journey with Christ now, do you see the need to commit to that experience? Your commitment card is, is, is a place where you need to talk to God right now. You may be in a place where, like Moses, you knew that you've been chosen and you think that your life has been orchestrated, but you have realized that what you thought was not His will, but just your own. You may have been like Elijah. And you, and you have thought that you already were in with God, that you have heard His voice, that He has used you, that He has blessed you, gave you miracles, gave you power, worked through you. But today, the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you and says, no, there is, there is more surrender. You may be even facing a 
the same sentiment that Elijah faced <laughs> under that tree. Or you may be like Job. You're living the Christian American dream. But even he needed to see God in a way that he hasn't seen him before. Brothers and sisters, the baptism is an essential part. And Jesus not only calls us to be baptized, not only calls us to baptize others, but he demonstrates to us. And I'm not going to pick up these cards today. Now, if, I told, as I told you, Megan, if the Spirit moved you, respond to it, uh, you know, and, 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 and give it to me in the way it is. But my, you know, my goal is not, not to throw you in a tank or to, or, or to sell you something. My goal is to help you to realize how important you are to Jesus. That not only did he, through his death and life, as, 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 as enriched it in, you know, and, 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 and cleansed our sins and, 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 and gave us the forgiveness and gave us the future, but that he even wants to impact your life now. And he wants you to help to understand what is coming and how he is an integral part. He wants to declare to you that he loves you just as he declared Jesus. Because you are his child. He has predestined you to salvation. He has seen you. But he also wants to lead you. May he bless you. May he help you to understand the depth of his commitment to you so that you and I in our response may do what Jesus said. Your will, not our will may be done. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for another opportunity we have had to come to honor you, to worship you, to study at your feet. Lord, we thank you for the message of the gospel and how it not only talks about life of Jesus, but how it brings the life of Jesus into our own and helps us to understand the past the future, but also the immediate. Father, just as you have immediately declared Jesus to be your loved, beloved son, we earn and we long for your revelation as well. Not revelation based on our expectations, but as you, God, see it, and then we ask you to drive us. Father, help us to commit to you so much we would recognize your Holy Spirit and we would allow him to do his work in our lives. Help us to see you, God, not only as a, as, a, as a measure of blessing, but help us, help us to see you as a measure of transformation, believing that even the fertilizer of our life has been allowed or even designed by you to help us to grow, to produce, and to be a benefit. Bless us, guide us, transform us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.